Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Dr. Downing. Good, e good evening, everybody. Everybody. All right. Good evening. Welcome to the Anaheim Elementary School District March 3rd special board meeting. I'm AESD Board President Mark Lopez. I call this meeting to order at 5.30 p.m. This meeting is being conducted telephonically and by means of live video broadcast on our Anaheim Elementary YouTube channel for members of the public. Board members and cabinet members will be video conferencing together to assist in managing the logistics of the meeting. For English, you may connect by phone as follows. Call 928-793-9363. When prompted, type in the pin 533-875-362-POUND. Para español, puede conectarse por teléfono de la siguiente manera. Llame al 414-909-7035. Cuando se le pida, presione el PIN 640-824-282 y el símbolo POUND. Any member of the public has an opportunity to address the board by submitting comments by 4.30 p.m. on Wednesday, March 3rd, 2021, online via an electronic form as outlined in the public speaker's portion of this agenda. Submissions will be read aloud during the board meeting by the board president or designee. Let's begin with the board roll call. Item 1A, board member, Dr. Paolo Macalas. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, board member, Ryan A. Rellis. Hello. Board member Juan G. Alvarez. Good evening, President. Board clerk Jackie Philbeck. Hello, everyone. And again, I'm board member Mark A. Lopez. Item 1B, public speakers on agenda items. There are 11 public speakers tonight. Yes. Take it away, Iris. Thank you. Um, submitted by Debbie Resnick. AESD staff, I would like to express my concern regarding the return to hybrid teaching schedule. As much as I and all teachers want to get back to the school site and to have real face-to-face -face relationships with our students, I don't feel it is safe enough for us to do that. Vaccines for teachers have just become available and many teachers are still not able to set up an appointment. Many teachers will not be fully vaccinated by the time we are set to reopen. I'm also concerned with a possible surge in cases that often follows a holiday as we are expected to have students return after spring break. At this time, I would like the school board to consider waiting for spring break COVID case numbers to come in before we make the decision to return to in-person teaching. Next public comment submitted by Cindy Timothy, ASD staff. My name is Cindy Timothy and as a teacher, I have a number of concerns regarding the school reopening plan. To start testing students as early as March 15th for a return to site date ranging from March 29th through April 12th, which is after spring break, which is a time where families are likely to travel, does not deem that test result accurate any longer. A student could test negative on March 15th and return to school on April 12th, perhaps having contracted the virus between that time. Data shows that COVID numbers escalate after holiday breaks. So there is no reason to assume that this will not also happen after our spring break. Pre-K students return to school for one day before spring break is not a good plan for them. They will certainly experience a tremendously wide range of emotions on that first day of live in-person learning which will be one day of them in that week, then have spring break for a week, then return again for one day a week for the remaining eight weeks, which will make for a total of nine days of live instruction in the nine weeks that are part of this plan. I can say with 100% certainty from my professional experience that those nine days will be filled with tears, screaming, kicking, and crying as the first few days and weeks of school for these young students is the hardest part of the year. Going through those extreme emotions once a week for nine weeks is definitely not what is best for them. TK and kinder students returning to school for two days before spring break is not a good plan for them either. They will certainly experience a tremendously wide range of emotions on that first day of live in-person learning, which will be two days for them in that week 
and then have spring break for a week and then return again for two days a week for the remaining eight weeks, which will make for a total of 18 days of live instruction in the nine weeks that are part of this plan. I can say with certainty from experience that those 18 days will be filled with tears, screaming, kicking and crying as the first few days and weeks of school for these young students is the hardest part. Going through those extreme emotions twice a week for nine weeks is definitely not what is best for them. I do want to return to site to provide live instruction. However, I want to do so safely. To date, many teachers have not been able to secure their first injection, let alone ensure they will receive their second dose by the time they are to return to live instruction. I feel that the disruption that returning to live instruction will cause at this point of the school year is not what's best for students. Finishing this school year virtually is the best plan for all stakeholders involved. Next comment submitted by Miguel Lopez, AESD parent. Esteemed members of the board, I am writing this letter as a statement of concern regarding the planned reopening of John Marshall Elementary School within the next few weeks. Current data from Orange County's Department of Health and the City of Anaheim indicate that the positivity rate within our school district is 6.4%. Recommendations from the Centers for Disease Control and the World Health Organization state that any level of government should only consider reopening once said rate falls below 5% for more than 14 consecutive days. Our district as, as a whole continues to disproportionately suffer from the effects of the SARS-CoV-2, which includes some 5,237 positive cases for children across the city of Anaheim. Indeed, Orange County published statistics indicate that the overwhelming number of infected children come from just a handful of zip codes that in part compromise the John Marshall Elementary School community. I urge members of the board to please postpone the proposed reopening of our schools until our cumulative positive positivity rate falls below the accepted threshold for safe in-person classes. Yes, I understand that the same Center of Disease Control re recently recommended that schools reopen across the country. However, that recommendation is contingent upon containment of community spread in addition to face masks, physical distancing, and hygiene. We have all suffered from this pandemic to varying degrees, and I understand that the respective situation facing families in my community make online learning less than ideal for some of us. I also understand that various pressures from the state, county, and even from some within the district are mounting in order to have face-to-face uh, -face instruction. But the potential negative consequences from postponing school reopening do not overweigh the very real dangers from ongoing local coronavirus spread, especially in light of new virus variants that recently surfaced across our state. Thank you for your consideration. Next public comment submitted by Juliana Alvarado, AESD staff. Dear board members, I am a preschool educator and would like to address a major concern with the reopening plan of schools. As many of us are now available to take the vaccine, it has been a challenge to schedule an appointment and a major factor of not securing ourselves before we are put safety into a classroom. I feel that if educators and students' health and safety is truly the primary priority, we will let this process take place and not try to rush or fall into pressure to open up. The reality is that teachers need to feel safe about entering the classroom, especially by fully vaccinated, vaccinated beforehand. I want to return safely to the classroom. I just hope you continue to put the priority of teachers' health and allow the time for us to become fully vaccinated before returning. This would be the most ethical thing to do for educators having to tackle so much already. Kindly, a pre-K educator. Next comment submitted by Geraldine, AESC parents. Schools need to reopen because students need to be back in class. The increase in mental health and suicides is alarming. Two teens in our Anaheim area committed suicide at the beginning of this year. Although it was not at the elementary level, it was too close to home. Next public comment submitted by Jesse Alvarez, AESC parent. Our COVID story. One of the last text conversations that I had with my brother-in-law, BJ Alvarez, was him telling me, no matter how much we disinfected and stayed clean, 
it, COVID, still got us. He died 15 days later on January 2nd, 2021, at the age of 36. His brother, Nestor Alvarez, died the same day, within the same hour, at the age of 43. Their mother, Martha Alvarez, died one month later on February 4th, 2021, at the age of 72. Nestor received dialysis treatments three times a week and is likely where he contracted the virus and unknowingly brought it into the home infecting his brother. The dialysis center is an establishment that was essential to his health and had to maintain the highest safety standards to remain open for their patients. It is still unclear where their mother and younger brother Jesus, who has since recovered, contracted the virus. Four out of six adults living in the same household where they all knew of the risks and took every precaution to stay safe contracted COVID, resulting in the death of three of them. And now today we are deciding that it is safe enough for my five-year-old that is not eligible for the vaccine to return to a classroom with other unvaccinated five-year-olds. Staff may or may not be fully vaccinated when they return to their classrooms. My five-year-old does not fully comprehend the risks and precautions necessary to stay safe, as did my brother-in-laws and my brother and my mother-in-law. And I will not be there to make sure he is being as safe as he should be. Can the district can the board look me in the eye and tell me for certain that we will not see more death in our family if I send my child back to in-person instruction? Can you look every family and every staff member in AESC in the eye and tell them that all the safety protocols in place will 100% ensure that they will not contract COVID or bring the virus into their home from school? I can barely keep my grief and anxiety from crippling me. I cannot bear another COVID death, and I do not wish this grief on any other family. Again, as my brother-in-law BJ said, no matter how much we disinfected and stayed clean, it still got to us. I urge you to keep our children and families and staff as safe as possible by remaining in distance learning at this time. Next public comment submitted by an AESD parent. I would prefer for reopen to be after spring break. Next public comment submitted by Jocelyn Rodriguez, AESD staff. Good evening, President Lopez, AESD board members and cabinet members. I'm writing in regards to the reopening plan that will be presented tonight. Currently, TK second grade will be returning March 29, 2021. Why? While I understand the importance of going back, I also want to ensure that decisions are not being made with monetary incentives in mind. The safety of our staff members and students should be top of mind. I would like to see all grade levels return after spring break, April 12, 2021. This gives all staff adequate time to receive both doses of the vaccine. As we know, the vaccine is most effective when both doses are received. As you may know, setting up an appointment to receive a vaccine has not been as smooth as it could be. Site crashes, canceled appointments, et cetera. Giving all teachers TK through six the same opportunity to receive both of their vaccines is the safest option. I would feel safer returning once I receive both doses of the COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you for your time and hard work in regards to a safe return for all. Next public comment submitted by Sandy Vasquez Tenkersky, ASD parent. I realize my daughter's education has been below standard with the distance learning. However, her health is far more important to me than anything else. I rather have the schools remain in distance learning until it is safe to return to school. And although things, although things may not ever be completely safe, I would rather wait until the chances are higher of not contracting COVID-19. Thank you. Next public comment submitted by Faith Davering, Labor Association representative. Good evening, board member, Superintendent Downing and cabinet. AEEA appreciates the good and ongoing communication we have experienced at and away from the bargaining table. 
The association and unit members have received ongoing communication about the blended learning model for educators and cohorts of teachers. We have always been provided with the opportunity to provide feedback. The 2020-2021 revised return to work MOU dated January 4th, 2021 is evidence of our collaboration at issue is how, in a short meeting on Monday, March 1st, the association was presented with, with plan to require classroom teachers to simultaneously provide instruction to both students in the classroom and those students remaining home. The association expressed a number of technological and instructional concerns and requested the idea be vetted prior to the SBAC meeting. This did not occur. The association conducted a brief survey with unit members with less than 20, a 24-hour turnaround. 69% of our unit members responded. Here are the highlights, highlights of the survey. 75% of respondents are uncomfortable, unsupportive of the district's plan to require classroom teachers to simultaneously provide instruction to both students in the classroom and those students remaining at home. 82% of respondents are uncomfortable returning to work on site while in the purple tier without receiving a vaccine. 59% of respondents are not comfortable returning to with on site in the purple tier having received a vaccine. 24% of respondents plan to take a leave of absence paid or unpaid if required to return to work in the purple tier and having received a vaccination. This is not just AEA. Returning to a blended learning model is about students as well. What model of teaching will, will kids have that provides for the most daily instructional engagement with teachers? The current model of teaching, virtual learning, has the most engagement for, for kids. How will peer engagement improve under a blended, blended model when kids choose to stay at home? Will special education students be able to receive true quality instruction when most of the time will be spent teaching routines and procedures? Our schools have never been closed. Do the optics of having students in the building look better than students learning from home? How many days of instruction will our kids actually get? With the passage of AB 86 in the past week, elementary school districts are under extreme pressure to return to in-person learning. New requirements and incentives are available for districts that return. AEEA asks that you please take a safety, take safety of students and staff, vaccination availability, and teaching requirements into consideration when voting on a return to in-person learning. Final comment submitted by Megan Baer, AESD staff. As a, special as a special education teacher in our district, I am eager to return to in-person learning. But with saying this, I also have many concerns about what is being asked of teachers. Based on the matter of teaching blended learned, where you are expected expecting teachers to teach both online and in-person, please think about our special populations that are in special education, but also in general education without support. There are many students that require behavior support that can include extreme behaviors where teachers will have to ev evacuate classrooms for student and teacher safety. These behaviors and decisions happen within a split second and decisions need to be made immediately without explaining to the students online what is happening. Please do not make us return in person just for the sake of state mandated tests testing that our students will not do well on, on anyways. Please choose one option, either in person or online, but not both. Teachers are superheroes, but we can only be expected to do so much. With our students' best interests at heart, please make an equitable decision that suits students of all ability levels. That concludes the public comments for today. All right, thank you for the public comments. Item two, adjournment to closed session. Is there a motion for closed session? So moved. Relis. You motion by Second. Mr. Relis. Seconded by uh, Dr. Magalis. Uh, we'll do a roll call vote. Dr. Magalis. Aye. Trustee Relis. Aye. Trustee Alvarez. Aye. Board Clerk Philbeck. Aye. 
I also vote aye. Passes 5-0. We'll re, uh, recess to closed session. Thank you. Dr. Downing, do we have all of our board members here? I will confirm. Okay, I see uh, board member Relis just joined. Um, we're still missing one. Yeah, we're missing. Uh, no, we have one, oh, two, okay. three, four. Um, looking for Dr. McCullis. Yes, yes. I believe we're all here. And okay, good President evening. Everyone, welcome to the Anaheim Elementary School District March 3rd special board meeting. I'm AESD Board President Mark Lopez. I call this meeting to order at 7.15 p.m. This meeting is being conducted uh, telephonically and by means of live video broadcast on our Anaheim Elementary YouTube channel for members of the public. Board members and cabinet members uh, will be video conferencing together to assist in managing the logistics of the meeting. For English, you may connect by phone as follows. Call 928-793-9363. When asked, type in the PIN 533-875-362-POUND. Spanish interpretation of the board meeting is available to attendees. Para español puede conectarse por teléfono de la siguiente manera. Llame al 414- 909-7035. Cuando se le pida, presione el PIN 640-824-282 y el símbolo pound. A few reminders, please mute your microphone when you join the meeting. Please unmute when you are announced to speak. It is important to honor everyone's voice while they are speaking, so please limit chats uh, during presentations. Board members, tonight all voting will be by roll call vote. When motioning or seconding an item, please state your name. For items being dis for any items being discussed, please state your name before discussing the item. Thank you. Item 3A, let's begin with the flag salute. Dr. Downing, if you would. Uh, please stand. Put your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Dr. Downing. Item 3B, introductions and roll call. Dr. Paolo Magalas. Hey, welcome everyone, I'm here. Thank you, Ryan A. Relis, board member. Good evening. Board member Juan G. Alvarez. Present. Board clerk, Jackie Philbeck. Present. Good evening, everyone. And I am Board President Mark A. Lopez. Superintendent Dr. Christopher Downing. Good evening, everyone. Assistant Superintendent of Educational Services Dr. Mary Grace. Good evening. Assistant Superintendent Human Resources Dina Mellon. Good evening. Assistant Superintendent Administrative Services Jesse Chavarria. Good evening, everyone. Senior Director of School Safety and Operations, Tracy Golden. Good evening, everyone. Our Senior Administrative Assistant, Iris Camacho. Hello, everybody. Interpreters, Mary Madrigal and Alina Avelar Roque. Good evening, everyone. And our Technology Support Technician, Janice Cato. Good evening, everybody. All right, thank you, everyone. 
Item 3C, report of closed session actions taken. There are none. Item 3D, adoption of agenda. Is there a motion? So moved. Rellis. Moved by Trustee Rellis. Seconded. Second by Dr. McAllis. Any discussion? We'll take a roll call vote. Trustee McAllis? Aye. Trustee Rellis? Aye. Trustee Alvarez? Aye. Board Clerk Philbeck? Aye. Also vote aye. Passes 5 0. Item number four special order of business. Item 4A School Reopening <laughs> Advisory Committee update recommendations. Dr. Downing, Superintendent. And Tracy Golden, Senior Director of School Safety and Operations. Good evening again, board members and the audience tuning in this evening. Uh, Iris Camacho is going to queue up our presentation and we will take you through uh, the presentation that was made to our School Reopening Advisory Committee during a meeting that was held yesterday, March 2nd. Uh, Iris, next slide, please. Uh, we'd like to begin this evening by sharing with you an update on COVID-19 data. Next. So at the top of the screen, you will see the four tiers um, that can be found in the California Safe Schools for All. Um, as a reminder, the lowest tier or widespread means that there are more than seven daily new cases per 100,000. Uh, the next tier is red, which would indicate that there are between four and seven daily new cases per 100,000. Uh, per the new COVID-19 and reopening in-person instruction framework provided by the California Department of Public Health on January 14th, Schools located in a county that has a new case rate of more than 25 per 100,000 residents were not permitted to reopen for in-person instruction. The current seven-day case rate of Orange County is 7.6 daily new cases. Um, I would let you know that the data that is reported every Tuesday has a two-week lag so the 7.6 indicates data from two weeks ago. Next slide. In looking at the March 1st data for Anaheim, we were at eight daily new cases. And Orange County, again, with the 7.6, that data is based on February 17th, 2021. It is estimated based on data taken from February 28th, that next week, Orange County will move into the red tier because the data that will likely be reported, again, this is a projection based on the data from February 28th was 4.7, which falls into the red tier. Next slide. Uh, we included this table because, you know, as we've explained to the community and to stakeholders, the data in Anaheim and Santa Ana has remained higher than all of Orange County. So this graph compares the orange, which is Orange County, and the blue, which is Anaheim. And as you can see uh, by the peaks, you know, in January, we were at 184 new cases. Uh, we are now down to, on February 28th, 8.6, and again on March 1st, 8. Orange County, as we have said previously, on February 28th was at 4.67. So again, uh, with our eight, we are approaching the red tier, and with continued decline, we'll be there as well. Uh, next slide, please. At this time, I'd like to give you an update on the state assessments and the actions under consideration by the uh, California Department of Education and the Board of Education, the State Board. Next slide, please. Uh, there is proposed state flexibility, and this information was as of February 24th. As it stands, 
Uh, California will be administering a shortened version of its statewide assessments. There will be offer of remote administration where feasible. California is applying for a waiver for the CAST, which is our science test for fifth graders. California is also applying for flexibility on the accountability dashboard data and the 95% participation rate, which is required under different circumstances and times. California did agree with the United States Department of Education that we should still be required to report to parents and public on the status of students' progress in English, language, arts, and math, and districts that can do so safely and appropriately by using state test can. And as soon as there is an update, as soon as any action is taken by the state board, we will share that not only with board members, but with the community as a whole. Next slide, please. At this time, I'd like to have Tracy Golden take us through the safety preparations that are taking place in our district. Tracy. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm happy to be here tonight to talk about uh, what we're doing. It's an ongoing effort that we've um, shared a lot with you previously, um, but I want to share a couple of new things that have uh, come up as we get uh, ready for in-person learning. So the next slide, please. So, um, you know, as we prepare to come back um, and have students back at our schools, we want to make sure that all of our safety protocols are in place. And so we have an school site uh, reopening checklist that all administrators are going to go through and make sure that they have all those items in place so that we are ready to have our students back on our campuses. Next slide. We will also be providing um, items that are going to uh, eliminate sharing and that will reduce uh, cross-contamination. So for instance, every student will receive a backpack that will fit their Chromebooks in it so they can carry that back and forth uh, between home and school. Each classroom will have cubbies so students can store their materials um, and not have them in desks where people can get to them or like the cohorts can share between them. So those are individualized and students will have their own materials. In addition, they'll also have their pencil boxes for all their, uh, you know, writing equipment, uh, crayons, glue sticks, things like that. Again, uh, reducing that sharing so that there isn't any cross contamination between students. Next slide. We also have a new position that is uh, we have been hiring and have. Oops, sorry. <laughs> um, that we started uh, this week. Our school safety assistants started on Monday, and they're going to spend this time uh, in the next couple of weeks before uh, students return, doing a lot of professional development so that they are ready uh, again for everyone to return to campus. Uh, they will be AED CPR first aid certified. Uh, they will be getting uh, some professional development and student management, supervision, uh, how to support students on the bus and at bus stops. Um, and in addition to all the general safety uh, protocols that we have around COVID-19. Next slide. We also have the reopening of Sunkist. Um, you can see on the right kind of a timeline of what has been going on as far as um, what we are doing to get it ready. By March 22nd, the school will be available for teachers and staff. And that does open up the uh, bus routes that we have been using to bus those students over to the key campus right now. And that will be um, make those available for the rest of the district to use as we bus our students to, to school. Next slide. And I think Dr. Downey, the next yeah, Thank okay. you. <laughs> Pass it back over. Iris, next slide, please. So board member, the following planned return to in-person learning uh, was proposed to our school reopening advisory committee. Uh, with this plan, we would have COVID testing for students um, between March 15th and 26th. We would have grab and goes for student reopening supplies, including the Chromebook carrying cases and other items that would facilitate a safe return for students. We are proposing that on March 29th, we return to in-person instruction with our hybrid model with preschool, TK, K, first and second, as well as our pre-K through sixth grade SDC. 
We are then proposing that our third through sixth graders return for in-person instruction, again, with a hybrid schedule on April 12th, 2021. Next slide, please. Uh, during the window of time prior to the in-person return dates, we would open enrollment for Anaheim Elementary Online Academy, but at the same time, provide an opportunity. And we feel strongly that as we continue to work with our association where our parents could keep their children in their home school and still have access to, again, uh, instruction. We would also offer COVID testing and access for our AESD staff. We are proposing that on March 22nd, we have a preparation day, a non-student day to allow staff to transition back to campuses. And then again, we would have principal chats to address site-specific safety protocols and schedules the week of March 22nd through 26th. Next slide, please. In terms of testing, uh, there is a second board agenda item this evening that would provide us an opportunity to do rapid testing clinics at our schools on a rotating basis. It would provide for families 15 minute results at our school sites, drive through and walk up are available. And then our staff, uh, in addition to being able to participate in uh, testing at their site. We also offer the ongoing opportunity for our staff to be tested at our key site. And we would increase testing days uh, between the 15th and the 26th. Next slide, please. So uh, we surveyed the participants uh, in the meeting and we had 135 responses from stakeholders and I'd like to now show you the results. Next slide, please. Uh, in support of the planned reopening, 68.9 of the SRAC participants support our district reopening with the aforementioned scheduled and 31.1% indicated that they did not support this plan. Uh, next slide. So everyone, um, for your approval this evening, based on the declining data for Anaheim and Orange County, uh, on behalf of the 68%, the SRAC recommends that the AESD Board of Education approve the reopening of schools, including a return to in-person schedule for students March 29th. And those students would include preschool, PK through six SDC and our TK through second grade students. And then a return to in-person for students in third through sixth grade on April 12th. And it is also a recommendation for the approval of the COVID-19 testing company that will be our next agenda item. So board members at this time, I'm happy to address any questions or concerns that you might have regarding this presentation. Thank you, Dr. Downing. Okay, board members, are there any questions for Dr. Downing at this time? Um, just one, Chris, and if you can, can you please go over again the lag period that you addressed earlier, the two-week lag period and those numbers? Yes, if we could, uh, Iris, go back to the slides, please. And Iris, let's go to the previous one, if you don't mind. So again, uh, every Tuesday, counties across the state report their data. And as you can see, uh, on Tuesday of this week, Orange County was at 7.6. This data has a two week lag. So this data is taken from February 17th. On Tuesday of next week, they will report data taken from February 28th, and it is projected that the Orange County rate will be 
board member, does that clarify? It does. Thank you very much. Thank you. Iris, we can exit now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Downing. Uh, any other questions? Seeing none, uh, we will move on to item 4B. It is recommended the Board of Education approve the recommendations from the School Reopening Advisory Committee, SARC, on the safe school reopening in line with the current COVID-19 data for Anaheim. Is there a motion? Um, I, I'm sorry, I'm a little confused. Is the, I would like to make an amended motion, but this is not the time for that. Correct. Okay. Seeing, uh, seeing there is no motion, uh, that item dies. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I understand now. Thank you. Is there uh, any uh, other? Uh, Amended motion or a secondary motion for this item. I would like to make a motion to uh, stay in distance learning uh, for the remainder of the school year. Okay, thank you, uh, Board Member Alvarez. Is there a second for this motion? I second that. All right, there is a motion and a second by Dr. McAllis. Discussion, please. I'd like to go ahead and begin. Um, and before I begin, I just want to say great presentation, uh, Dr. Downing. Uh, incredibly proud of all of our cabinet, all of our staff, of all of our principals. I firmly believe that when we are ready to reopen, that we will be the best district to be reopening safely. We have the Remy, Remy Halo systems. We have sneeze guards in place. You know, I visited sites and we have, you know, like protocols that are ready. You know, we have all the thermometers ready. Everyone's ready. But there are certain things that are out of our control. Now, before I begin, I would like to share a quote. And I'm going to read it verbatim. That Dr. Rochelle Walensky, the Center for Disease Control Director, stated just last week, we may be done with this virus, but clearly the virus is not done with us. We cannot get comfortable or give into the false sense of security that the worst of the pandemic is behind us. Not now, not when mass vaccinations is so very close. And yes, it is so very close. We just rolled out uh, 1B where our educators are gonna now start getting uh, vaccinated. Some have already started getting vaccinated. And in Orange County, as of last Friday at 3 p.m., we started opening it up and you know teachers are signing up and are on their way to get their first vaccine. But based on our proposed date of reopening, then all of our teachers will have only gotten the first shot. And what is of biggest concern to me, what of my biggest concern is that, and I'm looking at the science, that even though we, our teachers are vaccinated, they could still spread the disease. They could still spread it to, their, to our students who could then spread it to our communities and to our families who have not been vaccinated. Our numbers are going down. Something's working, we're doing great. Our daily cases are going down and it has been consistent. But again, there's things out of our control. We don't know if there's gonna be a surge during spring break, around the time when we're proposing our kids to come back to school. So why open now? I think that it's time that we just let our families know that, uh, that for the rest of the school year, it's gonna be all virtual. Um, let them start planning. Um, let our teachers also uh, not have that anxiety as well and let them plan over the summer, uh, get ready for uh, the, the amazing plan that our cabinet has put in place in the fall. Let's start a brand new school year that way. Not a brand new school year where students are coming back and, you know, a lot of us are educators. You know, the first day is very difficult. Finding your classroom, finding your new teacher, finding your desk. But then to add all the things happening with the current pandemic and the anxiety and the risk, 
I think we should just wait till the rest of the school year, do it all distance, and give an opportunity over the break uh, for us to plan even better. And that's all I have to say. That's why I uh, support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McAllis. Any other board members? I'd like to speak on it. Um, kind of where Dr. McGullis was going at the beginning of his uh, statement. Um, I just want to put it out there. I understand the enormous uh, energy that has been put into creating a plan that is viable for our community. I am 100% confident that the plan that you all laid out for us and our, and our families is the safest possible plan we could ever come up with. I know that for a fact. I have full confidence in our staff and the leadership of this district. Um, however, I want to share a little bit about uh, the story of what's been going on with my family. So uh, not a lot of you uh, out there know, but my family is an immigrant family. My parents come from Mexico and they immigrated here in the 70s and they're, they're really hardworking families. Uh, the location where I live, I actually had cousins that grew up down the street. So this neighborhood that I'm currently living in representing here in Anaheim Elementary is really near and dear to my heart. I actually have a, a great aunt who grew up literally five houses down from here in a mobile home park. So my family represents the students and the families of AESD, social, economically, and uh, culturally. So I get it. Our families are hard workers, they're essential workers, they're out there putting themselves at risk because they have, they have no choice. They have no choice but to work hard and bring in money for their family and go out and uh, gamble with their health because uh, there's no choice, they have to work. And so unfortunately that's what's led to the high numbers in our community. We're out there servicing people that disregard science and they spread the disease to our communities. And now our communities are the ones that are, are, are suffering the consequences. Um, and so recently, in January, I actually lost two of my brothers to COVID-19 complications. And a month later, I lost my mom to COVID-19 complications. It's the reality of my life, and this nightmare is the most horrible nightmare you could ever imagine. And I never thought a year ago when we went to distance learning that this was going to happen to me. But this is the reality, it happens to people. And so what's what's going on here is we're letting it happen, happen to people if sh should we open. And uh, um, I know that although the pods for the vaccines have opened up, our, staff's, our staff members won't be ready to come back in a, in a safe, in a way that's safe for them physically and mentally, right? I actually read uh, an article this weekend about scientists saying that they're they're expecting a surge in March, um, in late March. And so that puts us right around where we would have ha proposed to open. The, the press and government agencies are pushing for us to open under the guise of equity. This is an equity. Let me give you some examples of things that are not equitable, right? We're accepting the fact that it's okay to sacrifice people of color. My neighborhood represents workers who are mostly Latino and they only represent 11% of the current vaccinated population. That's an equity issue. The county is currently delaying pods from opening in both Santa Ana and Anaheim communities. That's an equity issue. Our children don't have a vaccine approved for them yet. That's an equity issue. Nationwide, our districts are being asked to provide standardized tests to our students during a pandemic. That's an equity issue. Knowing that our communities of color are the ones who are gonna be further spreading the disease to their own families and suffering the long-term effects that we know COVID is having on people and allowing our children to be the ones who are gonna suffer those long-term uh, mental effects and uh, physical effects, that's an equity issue. Expecting our families to uproot themselves yet again and restructure their entire calendar and schedule so that we can facilitate hybrid learning, that's an equity issue. 
And these people who are promoting the fact that we're somehow taking something away from our families by not going in person, it's it's a crock. It's a political movement. I have a five-year-old who's learning Spanish at Horseman Elementary via distance learning. He loves his teacher. He loves his classmates. He loves the activities. He's learning. You put him into this decision or you put me into the decision of giving him uh, the space to return to the classroom and that's not gonna be provided for him because he's not going back to a classroom right now. This is not the time for that. It is not safe. That's an equity issue. An equity issue that families like mine have suffered forever. This is a, a, in, a, just an educational equity issue. And if I understand some families just don't know facts or they don't know something and they think, yeah, that's, it's we're ready to go back. And I think what they're expecting is that we're gonna go back to normal or something to that effect, right? There's no such thing as returning to normalcy right now. The world has changed. There is no normalcy, all right? So don't be, don't be fooled by the fact that if we go back, it's gonna be normal. Here's the reality of what's gonna happen when we, if we decide to go back. We have to facilitate a hybrid model, which uh, uh, brings our students into in-person instruction for two days out of the week in a minimum day type environment. So for two days, we'll get a total of maybe 16 days of in-person instruction filled with who knows how many days of standardized testing. Parents and guardians are going to have to figure out what to do with their childcare issues in this strange hybrid model where they have to one day be on, one day be off, one day be on, one day be off. There's a guaranteed risk that families will con contract COVID-19. Our children will become a vector to further spread COVID-19 to our families. People will die. That's the reality. So these are these are the reasons why I feel so strongly to have made this motion. We cannot go right now. It is not the time. We love our children. We love our students. We love our staff members. But it is not safe for us to go back yet. And I I look forward to the day where my my child can go to first grade and meet his teacher and have a first day of school and experience that, but right now is not the time. We just can't do this. It's a matter of being human and loving one another and not allowing another human life to perish. That's something we cannot do. Uh, at least it's something I cannot do. So that's where I stand and I really appreciate everyone listening to to my position on this, and I hope that the rest of our board members will support this motion and guaranteeing that our students do continue to get their education and do continue to uh, get provided the best opportunities possible, but via our distance learning program. And it's been a, a great experience. Our students are learning. Our teachers are working so hard. Our staff is working so hard. Our district leadership has worked tirelessly for this plan, and it is appreciated but it's just not the time. Thank you. Thank you, board member Alvarez. Uh, any other comments, board members? I just also wanted to add that, you know, during the summer, uh, and it's not just the teachers getting vaccinated, it's the rest of the country, right? I'll make sure that they ensure that they get both shots uh, in time for fall and the rest of more people in the country and the community. Right. Thank you, Dr. Magalas, for adding that. Um, and thank you, Do um, Trustee Alvarez, uh, for your comments. Uh, yes, Ms. Philbeck? Mr. Alvarez, to, I hear you in what I've watched you go through. I understand. I can't understand it totally because that's something that you have to experience to really understand to walk in another person's shoes. So to say that I 
cannot totally agree with you right now is, is, uh, it's, it's painful for me. And I want you to know that it's not political. It's not, it doesn't have anything to do ex with anything except to, I've always felt it's okay to have a plan, just, just a plan. I've lived here 60 years and I love the people in this community. I love the children. When I see those children, I see my grandchildren. I never, ever want to do anything to impair the safety. But as we're going in the right direction, I would just like to have a plan. I And I'll say right now, I... I, Dr. Downing, I would like you to state again publicly that a plan is a plan, that am I correct that at any point as we move towards this date, we have the option for whatever reason, if we feel that it's not right or the data shifts or there just isn't even that confidence in it that we do not have to, it's not set in stone. We don't have to open on the day we're projecting if we choose not to, correct? Yes, board member. If the conditions change and it would warrant us not reopening, then based on guidance from our legal, uh, we would have that right as a board. Do we have the right if we just um, reconsider it based on what we don't even know might come up right now? Just a personal opinion. Um, just, you know, we don't have to do it if we don't want to. The plan is just on paper, basically, right? It is a plan um, and it's information for our parents so that they could begin planning appropriately. Um, as you saw in the plan, it would outline some available COVID testing free of charge for not only our staff, but for our families as well. Um, additional supports. So, you know, again, we've laid out uh, a plan that would provide us the opportunity to bring our, our students back. Um, we've shared and previous board meetings, the safety protocols that are in place in our schools that can't be found in any other district. Um, other districts have reopened and there have been no reported outbreaks uh, from a district reopening in Orange County. Um, additionally, we have had students participating in the YMCA daycare program and there is no confirmed spread that has occurred uh, with those students. So hopefully I answered your question, board member. But Thank again, you. just going back, should the conditions change, the board could take appropriate action. And Dr. Magalis, I want you to know I heard you too. I did. But Juan, you're the one I want to face right now and say that I'm sorry. Um, that I would like to have a plan and that I'm sorry that I can't agree with you 100% because I, I can't even imagine and I, I just want you to know I hear you and it's tearing me up to see you so broken over what has happened to your family. So forgive me. Um, because I respect you and I feel for you. Trustee Philbeck, um, I'm sorry, but we do have a plan and it's an amazing plan, but we're just asking to push the plan back. There are things that are out of our control. Um, we don't know if there's gonna be a surge during spring. 
And uh, you're right, uh, Dr. Downing, with regards to other counties, I mean, other uh, districts throughout Orange County, but just based on the data that you were showing, Anaheim and like Santa Ana has been higher than all the other counties. So I think that uh, the context uh, is, does play a little different role here in our community, uh, given that we are one of the largest uh, uh, with regards to COVID rates. Um, so I, I just have to say that, but um, I just I do. That. And I'll clarify that if the motion, which is to not open at all this year, that is what I would not support because I do want to have an opening date as part of a plan. So that's basically what I'm saying is I would not be in agreement to, to set it in right now that we're not going to open at all. So Wait, point of clarification, wasn't the motion to uh, start in the fall still though, Trustee Alvarez? No, it was uh, to stay in distance learning through the end of this school year. The end and of school. I think we're ready to discuss what that would look like further. I think the, the next couple of months would then develop us into looking to what that would look like. Um, so I didn't want to suggest any plan for after this, this school year. All right, thank you, uh, Ms. Philbeck, and, and uh, thank you, Board Trustee Alvarez, for the clarification. Um, I, I will say, um, Ms. Philbeck, I, I tend to agree with you. I think that we have having a date can be anxiety inducing for a lot of people. Um, and there has been a lot of kind of yo yoing back and forth. Um, we do have a precedent for having delayed our planned reopening in the fall in January. Uh, we did have a second vote on that to push that back. Um, and, and here we are now in the beginning of March uh, discussing the same thing we did in November. Um, so there is a lot of, of added stress that there could be for staff, for families. Um, with that being said, I, I think it is important, though, that we offer our parents the opportunity, our families some opportunity uh, that if they are comfortable returning, and we offer them alternatives to continue in distance learning if uh, they see that as the best option forward, uh, that they can continue that. And I trust our superintendent, I, I trust our professional staff to make uh, those exemptions uh, and to work with our, our different uh, employee units uh, and groups to ensure that, uh, that they're comfortable. And that um, to, to Trustee Alvarez's point, um, there are uh, some of our community members may be less informed and that is a challenge. That's a challenge in how we reach them. How do we communicate to them um, that this is not mandatory? They shouldn't feel compelled to go back. They may defer because they think uh, we're the educational professionals and they should just defer to us out of uh, just custom or because that's just what they're used to. Um, and it's really going to be a challenge for us to communicate to them that we don't want to put any of their family members in additional uh, exposure or risk uh, of, of returning to campus. Uh, and Dr. Downing, is it possible that we could we could do that, uh, reach out, um, continue our, our public communications campaign to ensure that they are aware of that? Um, I don't know, just even at the classroom level, uh, the teachers know and the staff know these students and families best. They know them personally in many cases, and that might be another option to make sure that they're in the curriculum letter in at the at the site level uh, that they're aware of this. Yes, yeah, so in our communications plan, uh, we would also have a town hall, we would have principal chats taking place at all of our schools. Uh, we've developed some safety videos, uh, we continue to work with the Orange County Healthcare Agency as well as Latino Health Access. So we have a, a different opportunities to continue to share safety uh, strategies, um, not just at a school site, but in the community as well. So yes, board member, uh, we can continue those efforts. And what I'm hearing you say is, can we take that down to the classroom level and our staff can, again, not only share videos that could be shown in classrooms, but uh, work to develop curriculum that would, again, focus on the areas that you've covered this evening. 
Thank you. I, I feel like that would just um, help alleviate some of the anxiety of, and maybe not all of the anxiety. I, I don't know if it's 100% possible ever to eliminate uh, any anxiety about it, but uh, just making sure that our families are informed um, and they're not being compelled to attend a physical classroom if that's not their in their comfort level. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Downing. Uh, Trustee Relis. Thank you, President Lopez. Um, <clears throat> you know, it, this is uh, uh, really um, one of the most difficult decisions that we as a board um, have been charged with, uh, um, with this board anyway, um, in regards to everything. And, um, you know, I just want to say that I really, really appreciate hearing everybody's perspective um, with this. And, and once again, kudos to Dr. Downing and, and your team in regards to um, the precautions that you're taking um, and in regards to um, the safety of our students and families and schools. Um, I, too, uh, have gone and checked out a lot of our school sites uh, uh, and whatnot, and I am extremely impressed, extremely impressed at um, the amount of um, due diligence they do, you know, um, and, and even uh, for myself, like a board member who basically they're familiar with. That doesn't stop them from taking my temperature. That doesn't stop them from giving me these questions. Even though I'm there like on a regular basis, I go on my walks and I'll stop by and, you know, and and, and that doesn't stop me. And I just want to give a shout out to um, the various schools and, and the administrators and whatnot that are doing that. Um, when it comes to the whole issue of 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 what we're, we've been doing and, and whatnot uh, in the distance learning, you know, um, We've had had some great success, you know. We've have had some great success in that, and I just want to give a shout out to Dr. Grace and the presentation that they gave. And once again, that was spearheaded um, in a lot of ways by you know this this idea of of learning loss and all this stuff and how it's that's not a good term because of the fact that learning is still taking place and teachers are working hard and you know lots of things are taking place, um, but. You know, I, I really, um, when it's said and done, I, I, I really am in uh, a little bit more in line uh, with my thinking um, with uh, Trustee Philbeck in the sense that I think we do need a date. Um, we do need a date and we do need to, 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 to have something that is there um, just because of the fact that, you know, the data is dropping and is that you know, are we sure that that's going to continue? Well, we don't know. I mean, that's data, you know, and we've seen it bounce up and down throughout the the months and throughout this entire year. Um, with that said, um, I do just want to make sure that, you know, the, the parents understand um, and whatnot that, you know, I want them to have options in regards to, um, the type of educational route that their kids can continue on. Um, you know, I have heard from parents uh, a lot as well of to, yeah, this is totally unsettling, but um, there's light at the end of the tunnel for a lot of our parents because they see the numbers going down. So they're seeing that they're going to go back to work, um, which is great for them and their families. Um, and, you know, this is like, there is such like, you know, Tressy Alvarez said, there is no such thing anymore as like returning back to normal, you know, um, that's the thing. There is no normal, like the world of education has changed. Um, so I, I, I do think that um, it would be, um, it, it would be great if, you know, I, I would support this if we could amend it um, to have a, a, another amendment, um, but, with the date that we start to kind of start getting these policies and everything down to really focus a lot on the idea of what can you do at home to make sure you're safe as well? What can families do? What can we do in our community, um, et cetera, um, to continue uh, to educate and, and, and push forth the safety precautions? Um, 
But once again, uh, I don't want them um, to be limited in that scope where they can only do that virtually. Um, if they want to come in, I think that they should have that choice available. Um, and so I, I do support um, having a, a, a deadline. I'm not comfortable with how it is amended as of right now. I don't think I could vote for that right now. Dr. Downing, do we, and we have a board member on the 31st of March, correct? We do. Is it possible that regardless of what happens tonight of how we vote, that this discussion to meet can be continued or, ha or elaborated on at another board meeting also, depending on what has transpired in this I month? Think, well, I, I may be wrong, but I think if this motion passes, uh, a member of the majority vote would have to return it. Exactly, but it could be, but there could be yeah, discussion could be. if there were uh, details that are not apparent now that were apparent maybe, you know, by the 31st. Yes, uh, staff <laughs> already plans to provide updates at our board meetings on our preparations and, you know, to continue to look at data. Okay, because uh, I'm willing to amend, but I believe point of order, uh, Mr. Lopez, we vote on Mr. Alvarez. We'd have to vote on this one first, right. I believe. Yes. And then, and then we can revisit for an amendment? Uh, depending on the outcome. Depending on the vote. And, yeah, if depending on the vote, of course. Yes. Okay. Uh, and and uh, with, uh, go ahead, Dr. McAuliffe. Oh. I was waiting for the vote. Oh, okay. All right. Well, in that case, uh, seeing no other discussion, uh, we have the motion by Trustee Alvarez, seconded by Dr. McAuliffe, that we continue in distance learning for the remainder of the school year, just so we're all clear on the, the motion. Uh, we will begin with Dr. McAuliffe. Aye. Trustee Rellis? No. Trustee Alvarez? Sure, with the health and safety and well being in mind of all of our stakeholders, aye. Board Clerk Philbeck. Toughest vote I've had in six years. No. Uh, I also vote no. The motion fails two uh, to three. Is there an amendment motion? Amended motion? Yes since I'm not happy with the original dates, I move to accept the recommendation of the SARC with the exception that we move the reopening date for the preschool students, the PK through six SDC students, the TK, K, first and second grade students to April 12th, and the third through sixth grade blended learning students to April 19th. I second. All right. The motion, motion. Uh, motion by Board Clerk Philbeck and seconded by Trustee Rellis. Any discussion? And that is all after spring break, right? That's correct. That's I just wanted to clarify that. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Philbeck, uh, is there any other discussion on this item? Uh, I just want to say that I just really want to make sure that once again, that parents understand that they are not obligated to bring their kids to in-person instruction. And I'm expecting district to really go full-fledged campaign with them in regards to informing them of these various options and their choice. Thank you, Trustee Rellis. I think message received, uh, Dr. Downing. Um, this is, uh, all right, thank you, Dr. Downing. Uh, as you mentioned, Board Clerk Philbeck, um, this is a tough decision. This is probably, the, this is a, by far a tougher decision than the decision to close our campuses, uh, our physical campuses back last spring, because by comparison, that was easy um, in the sense that uh, a, a lot of people were sick, um, the pandemic was raging. We, we didn't know 
uh, all the information that we have now, uh, the decision to return to campus, to a physical campus, giving that option uh, has varied by school districts throughout the entire state. Uh, so it is it is more challenging because there is that concern for the health and safety of our students and our families. Uh, and I know this is not a decision that any of us makes lightly. Uh, this is something that we've been wrestling with for the last several months um, on, on how and when we would return. But uh, going back to the idea that this is a plan, uh, this is our intention of when and how we would like to return to campus. And I think just like any other big decision you make in life, uh, whether it's it's moving for a job, whether it's getting married, whether it's uh, applying to college, uh, you want to have a plan in place uh, ahead of time. Uh, you may never use that plan, but you want to have it there uh, just in case uh, we, we do have some of our parents and our students who want to return. We have some of our staff who wants to return. Um, None of our groups, none of our stakeholder groups are monolithic entities. Uh, even our board is not an, a monolithic entity. We vote, uh, I, I think, based on all, all of our educational philosophies, we vote similarly most of the time. But there are these decisions that come up where uh, we have different perspectives. We all want the best for our students, for our families, uh, for all of our uh, AESD family as well. Um, we just see, uh, I think, different ways of getting there to the best way that we could serve them somehow. And um, I respect everybody's position and their stance on that this evening. Um, I, I know we've all expressed that uh, tonight. Um, there is no perfect solution. Uh, there will never will be because our state, our county, uh, our school district, and Lord knows our, our school board is made up of imperfect people. Uh, uh, being exhibit A, uh, I, I, I can attest to that. I, I'm far from perfect. Uh, I know that uh, we're all striving uh, to do what's best and create that perfect uh, situation for our, our families and our students um, the best way that we can. And we're doing making the best decision uh, with the information that we have at, at this point. And, um, I just want to thank everybody for your your input. Um, I know that uh, this is nothing that uh, you know Dr. Downing takes lightly, and our staff. Uh, so I appreciate everybody that has um, has given a comment. Uh, we'll go with uh, Board Clerk Phil Beck and then uh, Trustee Alvarez. I just want to say this isn't going to leave my thoughts daily from now until whenever we get to the point of what we actually end up doing it's not an easy decision and it does kind of hurt that i couldn't support you totally mr alvarez just know that i do care deeply about what you've experienced and uh, this this isn't an easy decision and it will not leave my thoughts on a daily basis from now until when, whenever we actually put something in action. Thank mm -hmm. you, I just wanna clarify, this wasn't about uh, my experience, it was about preventing it from happening to somebody else. But Dr. Downing, if you could actually um, clarify for us how many days of instruction we will be providing our students, should we go with this April date? So I wanna provide our community an actual account of what we're risking the lives of our students for. How many days are our kids gonna get of instruction based on this pr proposition? With the return to in-person instruction for our preschool through second grade and our PK through six on April 12th, they would have eight weeks and three days uh, with our hybrid schedule and our third through sixth grade students would have seven weeks and three days of our hybrid schedule. So that adds up to how many total days? Because a week sounds like it's five days per week, but it's not. Well, it varies uh, based on their grade level. And um, I can have Iris show again the schedule. Iris, if we could... Uh, bring up the presentation 
and we'll look at again uh, once you bring it up we'll go to the next to last slide Thank you. So in order for us to have our small cohorts for improved safety and per the guidance of the California Department of Public Health, preschool students would have an opportunity to return for one day per week. Our pre-K through sixth grade SDC students would return five days per week in person, smaller class sizes. Our TK through second grade students would have the two weeks per day, and our third through sixth grade students would have the two weeks per day. And again, just to clarify, um, based on the feedback from the board, we will communicate that this is an opportunity for families to come back for in person. Um, and we heard the communications from the board loud and clear. All right, thank you, Dr. Downing. Thank you. So for example, if I'm a sixth grade parent and I have a sixth grader and they're returning two days per week and we start on that April what 19th day, how many days were my child go to school? That's what I want answered. answer, thank you. Uh, 15 or 16. Thank you. And also to clarify, 15 or 16 days, and some of those will be filled with standardized testing, right? So we're returning back and providing our kids with even less instruction because the federal government's requiring us to test our kids, right? So let's say there's four days. So we're just putting out there maybe four days of testing or a sixth grader might be coming back for 11 days and risking the, their lives. That's what we're looking at. I just want to clarify that. Well, uh, on behalf of the board uh, and our district, uh, we feel strongly that the safety protocols, um, and again, based on the other districts in Orange County that have reopened, um, that our students would not be risking their lives, that our protocols will, uh, again, allow our students to social distance, uh, desk guards, uh, PPE and our students who have been on distance learning since last March, which is now a year, would have an opportunity to have 16 days of in-person instruction uh, to socialize. To uh, We have four-year-olds and five-year-olds who haven't sat in a seat in a school. So we would also, I would just like to say, we provide that opportunity as well. And uh, I just wanted to address the question in, in that way, because again, um, you know, we're encouraged by the declining data and, you know, our district has been very prudent in terms of remaining in distance learning until the data indicated that it would be safe for us to return. So uh, I just thank you for the opportunity to give those comments as well. But it is also, and I pray that this doesn't happen if the numbers do start going up. If something does happen because of spring break, maybe possibly this new variant uh, creates something that we just don't know, that we can't control. And really, y'all, that, that's just the reason why I cannot support it for the rest of this school year. There's so many unknowns. Again, I am not saying that we're not prepared with regards to our safeguards but just one life or just one possibility of a spread. I don't want to be, you know, contributing I want to help collectively um, to make sure and ensure our numbers go all the way down and end this. And I really think that, you know, we would need even the summer to ensure that our country, that our city does that. 
So I, I just had to throw that out there. Uh, but I know board members, this is the toughest decision that we've ever made on this dais. And it is such an honor to be working with all of y'all and our cabinet. I'm so proud of all the uh, measures that we've put in place and just this conversation and this discussion. And it's been very civil. And, uh, you know, I know y'all have been bombarded with text messages, emails, and a plethora of, you know, comments in various ways. And, and it's been a very difficult decision to reach this. Um, so very proud of all of us. I just want to share that before this vote. Thank you, Dr. Magalis. Um, I shared the same sentiment. Thank you very much for uh, your comments. Uh, and, and thank you, uh, Trustee Alvarez, for your clarification as well. Uh, seeing no other discussion, uh, I'll go ahead and call the vote. Uh, we will go roll call vote. Uh, again, the uh, motion on the floor is uh, that we return for our SDC students, uh, TK, kindergarten uh, through second grade uh, and preschool on April 12th and our third through sixth graders on April 19th. We'll go roll call vote uh, with Dr. Magalis. I vote no. Uh, Trustee Rellis. Aye. Trustee Alvarez. No. Board Clerk Philbeck. Aye. Also vote aye. Uh, motion passes three to two. Item 4C, it is recommended the Board of Education approve a service agreement between this district and Vital Medical Services, LLC, 700 North Brand Boulevard, Suite 220, Glendale, California, 91203, to provide COVID-19 rapid testing for students and staff, effective March 4th. 2021. The initial term of this agreement will expire on June 30th, 2022, unless otherwise terminated or suspended. District may extend the agreement at its sole option for two additional terms of one year each. The amount due for the agreement is on a fee for service basis and shall not exceed $2 million annually. Is there a motion? So moved. Rellis. Thank you. Moved by Trustee Rellis. Seconded. Second by Dr. McAllis. Thank you. Uh, any discussion on this item? So since the vote uh, from the last item was pushed back the date, shouldn't the dates of this be pushed back as well? Or um, just a point of clarification. Uh, we can extend the testing window. Um, and I believe with the dates being pushed back, um, you know, we could also offer testing during spring break uh, for uh, families and those that want to take advantage of it. This contract will allow us the opportunity to work with the company that can do the 15 minute rapid testing, which I'm sure there are a lot of families that haven't had an opportunity for every, you know, for their children to be tested and to get immediate results. So okay. yes, we can expand the window. Thank you, Dr. Downing. Thank you for the question. Uh, Dr. Magalis, any other discussion? Seeing none, uh, we'll take a roll call vote. Uh, Dr. Magalis? Aye. Trustee Rellis? Aye. Trustee Alvarez? Aye. Board Clerk Philbeck? Aye. I also vote aye. Passes 5 0. Uh, before we adjourn our meeting uh, tonight, uh, this takes item number five for our adjournment. But before we adjourn, I just wanted to wish uh, our superintendent, Dr. Downing, uh, a happy birthday. Oh, I know you'll be celebrating this weekend. Um, uh, you'll be celebrating the anniversary of your 21st, I believe. Uh, we won't tell you how many anniversaries it's been. But uh, Ooh, well, thank, okay. you, uh, thank you, Dr. Downing, for all of your hard work. We appreciate uh, everything that you're doing uh, for our district, uh, that you've been here um, really uh, working all these hours. You're still working hard uh, at the district office. So thank you very much for everything you do. Um, uh, with that, I will go ahead and adjourn our meeting. Uh, our next regular board meeting will be on Wednesday, March 10th. Uh, this meeting is now adjourned at 8.23 p.m. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Uh, good night, everyone. Thank good night, you. Everyone. Good, good night, everyone. Thank you.